So this is a, a little strange looking up. <laughs> Bill told me I could either be down there or here, so I'd much rather be closer to you so I could actually see you. I'm delighted to have the chance to talk to you all tonight. I'm go going to focus on the experiences that young children have with others and their environment and the impact that has on not only their learning and development, but their brain development. This is a pretty um, dismal picture. And this is not just at Houston Independent School District. It's really all over Texas and the country. We have anywhere from 59 to almost 80% of the children entering kindergarten not having the foundational skills in early literacy, math, language that they need to learn the things they're presented with in elementary school. And so I'm going to spend time tonight um, letting you see that picture and how it starts so early, and then talk about things we can do to change that picture and solve the problem. The first few years of a child's life are so important to focus on because so much is going on with early brain development. I'm not going to give you um, a detailed description of early brain development. I'm not a brain person. But I, I want to make a couple key points. There are synaptic connections beginning very, very early in the brain that are becoming increasingly more complex across the first years of life. So a lot is happening in those very, very early years. And the neural circuits become stronger dependent on whether they are used or not. And by being used, I mean the type of early stimulation and experiences children have with their caregivers that uh, determine whether certain connections are, remain or are dropped because they're not being used. We've got um, researchers now doing an amazing amount of work on early brain development. And they talk about the architecture of the brain and that if those experiences are strong and quality of quality and consistent, the brain becomes sturdy. If they're not, the brain becomes fragile. And that's a very difficult picture to turn around. A lot of research initially has focused on socioeconomic status and children from low-income homes versus middle and higher to show the devastating effects of poverty because of what it's associated with in the child's early experiences. And we're now getting much stronger research in terms of what the specific characteristics are in the home environment that cause the brain not to de develop effectively. So let's take a look at what, what is low SES, low in education, poverty, associated with? What are children not experiencing? Well, they're not experiencing consistent nurturing responsiveness. They're much more likely, if they're in low-income, low-educated homes, not to get responsive interactions. And combined with stimulation, cognitive stimulation, especially the lack of language in their homes. And then, usually because of the lack of finances, there are very few books. There aren't opportunities to get exposed to things in their world that they might see at the zoo or a museum. And then there's a whole array of things in their greater environment, uh, their neighborhoods, their communities, low occupations, so there's not rich conversations, um, poor childcare environments, much more likely to have uh, low quality childcare and low quality public school in neighborhoods uh, where low income families live. And then there's a high degree of stress, not just in the home, but in the community. So I'll just give you a few examples of some research that's looked at how this impacts the brain. By six months of age, when we don't even have 
behavioral measures of learning, we now see that low SES versus higher middle, higher SES shows differences in the power of brain waves in the frontal regions that are associated with language development. So the children from poverty who are not being stimulated have less um, lower power brain waves in the frontal regions. And then a, a group of studies very recently has looked more at what is it about SES besides stimulation and neglect, hostility, stress have been associated with negative impacts on the hippocampus. And ironically, the hippocampus is not only very important for memory, but it's important for children's ability to manage stress. So the stress in their environment is negatively impacting that part of their brain. And then very recently at Children's Learning Institute, we uh, did fMRI imaging with toddlers and analyzed those scans. And then we observed mothers and their toddler in what's called the frustrating gift task uh, situation. And the little guy is sitting there next to mom. There's a very enticing gift on the table in front of him or her with a big bow. And the mothers are told that before the child can have the gift, she has to fill out this questionnaire. And then we observe through videotapes and coding how mothers vary in their ability to support their child to deal with this frustration. And the range was just phenomenal from soothing, stroking, singing little songs with their child, all the way down to threatening, uh, finding the child negative and demanding. One mother took her shoe off and threatened to hit the little boy if he didn't stop crying. So when we looked at that variability in relation to uh, the integrity of white track matter, white, white matter track integrity, we found amazingly high correlations of 0.7 to 0.9 with that area of the brain, particularly amygdala and hippocampus, again, important for managing stress. So we, we are beginning to have this growing body of research that tells us we can't wait to intervene in pre-K or K. This, the big stuff is happening in the first three years of life. And if there are prolonged periods of disruption in these reciprocal responsive interactions, it can have a more negative effect on brain development than actual physical abuse. And it happens much more frequently. This graph from the Harvard Center on Development shows that neglect, which is lack of responsiveness, lack of attention to children's needs and taking care of those needs, uh, very uh, chaotic environments, that is happening, you can see, incredibly more and impacting incredibly more children than things like physical abuse, psychological maltreatment. And it has at as much, if not more, of a negative impact on brain development. Um, this is just a, a striking example of when you think of the children in orphanage, the Romanian orphanages, the, the difference in how their brains were working, the, the red, yellow, orange, those are the hot spots. And you see very little of that activity for children who are being cared for in large rooms with very few caregivers who are not really trained and don't have the time to be responsive and nurturing. And as these risk factors add up, then the risk of developmental problems adds up. And so we're talking about things like maternal depression, chaotic home environments, moving frequently because families lose their homes, losing jobs, not being attentive and reciprocally responsive to young children, and not stimulating them in terms of language input. So I've mentioned responsiveness a number of times. 
And I'm talking about it because it is the most frequently reported predictor of more optimal outcomes if it happens consistently across the first year, three years of life. And it's described as a three-term chain of events where the first link in the chain is the child signaling. It might be distress. It might be, hey, I want to talk to you, a vocalization, a gesture. And then the critically important second link is the caregiver noticing that signal promptly and interpreting it accurately and then responding sensitively and warmly in ways that are contingent to what the child signals they need. And then the very powerful third link in this chain is the child feeling valued, heard and valued, and that in turn develops a security for that child because they trust that their caregivers are there and, and are going to hear their needs and respond to them. And as that happens, time and time again, day in, day out, you have these sturdy, wonderfully engaged, curious, bright children developing. It's, it's that simple. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. So this, is, this type of interaction predicts all areas of a child's development, and it predicts it long term. So we're going to watch this video, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it, OK? You have a full belly. You have a full belly. So I think you can see that this is a matter of just engaging with the child, gazing at them, using an engaging tone of voice that's warm, gestures, touches. And you see that baby just open up. This is a very young infant, but starts to open up to that interaction with mom with gaze, with a little coo, which was hard to hear, maybe shaking the little legs. And that's the beginning of this sort of journey that will allow that child to develop language, social, emotional skills, self-regulation. And it needs to start very early. So let's watch this next one. This is a single dad who the mother abandoned the child, and he's the primary caregiver and a single parent. You're going to see very similar reactions from him and this little girl. Put these together just like this, my papa. See? See? Ho, ho. There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah see? That sound good? Huh? It sound like rain, huh? Come on. Boo, 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 boo. See? Can you all hear that? Yeah. Okay, good. So those are just two everyday examples of caregivers that are being very responsive to their very young children. And that's what will make the difference for these children. That's what will really change the trajectory of their development and their brain development. But there are so many children that aren't getting exposed to that type of responsiveness. Responsiveness in a very recent uh, study has been shown to have, and this was for thousands of children studied in a major national longitudinal study, they wanted to see if early responsive sensitivity 
would directly predict adult outcomes, or would it predict it in relation to events that happened along the way, thus indirectly? And they found that in the, what was happening in the first three years of life had a direct significant relation with academic outcomes at 32 years of age, as well as social development, uh, but to a little lesser extent. So again, pointing out this is not just something we wish would happen. This needs to happen for children if we're going to turn our education disaster around and the achievement gap that's widening as we're sitting here talking. Whoops. So within any socioeconomic level, there's some caregivers that are very responsive. In poverty, there's variability. And we're now beginning to understand why some caregivers are neglectful of their children and cannot seem to be responsive and nurturing. There are three interrelated risk factors. The first of these is that the caregiver does not perceive that they had a nurturing, supportive early childhood. And so they have a very poor sense of self and a poor trust in others. So you can start to see this cross-generational component. And then related to that, they will more often than not, when they hear a signal like a distress, a cry from their baby, it aggravates them. Their, their uh, interpretation is negative. The child's being demanding. Does it need to be crying? What's the matter with this baby? And there is a physiological reaction that's different for these caregivers. Their sympathetic nervous system does not react to this type of signal from an infant for attention or needs to be addressed like caregivers without these risk factors. So it's very important that we pay attention to this because programs could be developed that help prevent this type of neglect. Now I want to turn our attention to language development. Language development in low SES homes is the most negatively impacted skill of all the skills, even other cognitive skills. And it's probably, well, for me, it's one of the most important areas of development for children in order to get in school and succeed and ultimately in life. And we are seeing pre-kindergarten children enter with eight to 12 month delays in their language development. And now I've told you about what's happening in the brain in the early years before pre-K. We can't turn that around if we wait till pre-K. So they hear less language. It's of lower quality. They're much more likely to hear things like, get that, what's this? which some researchers have called empty language. They're not hearing the names of objects and actions. And then their brain starts to become less efficient in processing when they do hear language. And that has a cascading effect. I'm going to skip this one. There's a classic study in the mid-90s by Hart and Risley, University of Kansas, that demonstrated what is now known in a national initiative as the 30 million word gap. By four years of age, four-year-old birthday, children in lower socioeconomic homes heard 30 million fewer words than children in middle and professional uh, class, working class and professional class. So this was in the 90s. We still have this problem. Um, all over the country, there are different initiatives to try to address it. And it's a national program called Close the 30 Million Work Gap. One solution, and I'll talk about others, is reading. In a recent article in Pediatrics, reading, more home reading activities was found to support mental, the areas of the brain that control mental imagery and narrative comprehension. So if children hear stories, 
then that part of their brain starts to function more efficiently. And it has carryover to everyday conversation so that they can understand what the sequence of events someone's describing to them. Other people have said, let's be careful. It's not just about the words. We can't just push words out at children. It needs to happen in a certain context, a certain style of interacting. And they called it serve and return. The child serves a communication interest. Again, it could be a word, a point, and the caregiver needs to return that serve by looking, by talking, by gesturing. And when that happens, it not only will change the picture of that second slide I showed you, where kids are not ready for kindergarten, it predicts easily out into elementary grades uh, in terms of reading success. So I've talked about this cascading effect. If children aren't hearing words of high quality, names of things, what things mean, actions, then their brain is less efficient. And Anne Fernald at Stanford actually has demonstrated what that looks like for children from lower versus middle income homes when there is a big difference in the quality of words they hear and these reciprocal interactions. In her lab at Stanford, she has begun to study children with a very fascinating uh, task. These little guys have earphones on, and they're being exposed, and they're hearing words that are everyday words for them. And then they measure how the brain is processing, how long it takes to process, and they show that they know the right word by turning to the picture of the word they're hearing versus the wrong picture. And as early as 18 months, children in lower income homes have a difference, a significant difference in speed of processing. And as you can see, by 24 months, that becomes an even greater difference. And she's studying these children out across time. So again, the point that as the brain becomes less and less efficient, and that continues over time, you can imagine how by four years of age in a pre-K classroom, there is no way we can pump enough language at these kids and, and get the brain to suddenly change efficiency of processing. So I'm just very quickly Instead of pumping words at kids, we need families to know, and this needs to be embedded in parenting programs, that they need to be engaged with their child, be gazing at the child, and using language. It's not going to work to stand at the sink, washing dishes with your back to your little guy, talking. They, it, it doesn't help them develop language. And by the way, TV doesn't either. Putting these little guys, even in front of Sesame Street, when they're in the first three years of life, is not going to teach them language. And we have a, way too much of that going on. Rituals, routines, very basic things like having picture books and a certain time of the day pulling them out and point to things and caregivers say, what's this one called? What sound does it make? Or dressing routines, where as your dress, the child, caregiver's dressing the child, they're naming parts of the body. Are these your toes? I bet these are your knees. I love your little knees. This is just talk. We have a lot of caregivers that say to us when they start our parent programs, I didn't know you were supposed to talk to them before they could talk to you. That doesn't happen until a year or 15 months of age. So that much time for many parents who have not become aware of the importance of talking to babies, that much time goes by without child-directed language. What? Well, and then the third one is just 
beginning to make this more complex and extending these conversations so that children ultimately learn to stay on topic and carry on a conversation, which children that get this kind of interactions can start to have little conversations as young as two and a half years of age. And when this was studied, the use of these rituals, interactions, for very low income families, the ones that did this versus the ones that didn't, a significant difference was seen in the children's language development a year later. So we do have families that have good pickup of these types of behaviors. We just need to reach them with effective programs. So let's turn to effective programs. I want to talk a little bit about what makes a program effective because changing behavior isn't easy. If you've ever tried to change your own behavior, I think you might agree with me. You want to get more exercise. You want to eat differently. You want to be nicer to people. It's not easy to turn that around suddenly. You can't just get a pamphlet that says, try this out. And that's the same with changing parenting. Characteristics in effective programs are quite important in terms of being integrated. And for very high-risk families, the ones that are most effective focus on responsiveness, what it looks like, how to do it, everyday interactions, not expecting that they're going to change their life everyday routines. That's unrealistic. It needs to be embedded in what their routines and their activities are. Book reading and seeing videos of very believable families interacting in everyday situations that the families you're working with can relate to. And then active engagement, the bottom one, is critically important. So PALS, Play and Learning Strategy, is in three national What Works Clearinghouse. It's part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services McV home visiting programs. And federal funding can be directed to these programs. There's about 12 of them. PALS is the only one that changes responsiveness, changes language stimulation, and in turn, children's language development and self-regulation. Others are things like HIPPI, parents as teachers, Nurse Family Partnership, all good programs, but that they're, they're not looking at this set of behaviors. PALS was developed by Dr. Karen Smith and myself, UTMB, UT Health, a number of years ago, and it's now being used all over the country. And it's a basic set of behavior strategies that we're trying to get families to start using whenever they are interacting with their child at meal times, in bath times, dressing. And I think what's most unique about PALS and why it gets the kind of effects it gets in parent change is its format. No other programs have this format. We made a series of videotaped sessions for each of those strategies. Believable parents showing. The two videos you saw are out of PALS. Um, so the coach and the parent view those. They stop and start and talk about them. Moms might say, I didn't think she was doing a very good job, which is really nice because then they're paying attention and we ask why. And then they are videoed trying these strategies with their own child. And then they view them with their coach and critique what they think they did really nicely that their child responded to and what they would like to change and talk about how they might change it. And we also invite many other caregivers into these sessions. In fact, for two sessions, the primary caregiver that's in the program teaches other family members what's so important for them to pay attention to with this child. 
So this is a, we're going to listen to or watch this video now. This is one of the language uh, support session videos. And you'll see this mom engage and play, help her child problem solve through her language support. Okay, let's watch this one. What? Can we turn that up just a bit? Can I open the door, please? Uh huh. They will open the door. Uh, there they are. Are they still sleeping? Is it time to wake up? Uh oh. What happened? Uh oh. Hmm. How are you going to close that door? How do you? What happened? What happened? How will you close the door? Uh oh. There you go. You say, excuse me, Doc. Uh-oh. Oh. Oh. Open the door now. How do we open the door? The duck's in the way. Go. Oh, you want to keep the door closed. Okay. Me go. Excuse me, Cal. Okay, let me go out of the way. Do, 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 do. Okay, let me get out of the way. Okay. Now you can open the door. Good job. So, within that short interaction, that child learns to say, Excuse me, duck. Excuse me, cow to open the door. I just find this amazing, that that can happen in such a short interaction. Now, of course, this child has gotten great language stimulation, but they're like little sponges. And if they get that kind of support in fun, you could see this is fun, it's engaging. You can see that little guy's brain working. He's looking, he's thinking, and then he's got it. Excuse me, duck. Excuse me, cow. And he'll generalize that to other situations where he needs to have somebody help him out by getting out of the way. He'll say, excuse me. So these are the type of things parents see in this intervention. And with about, in the infant pals, they have about 10 sessions. We have changed the parent's responsiveness their labeling of words and actions, their provision of more gestures that are meaningful, and verbal scaffolding. And then that, in turn, explains the effect of the intervention on the child's increases in language, both complex and vocabulary, social engagement, and more recently, in one of, we've done many, many studies with PALS, federally funded competitive grant studies, we see self-regulation change in children. But home visiting programs are expensive because uh, you, you need a lot of people to go out and visit all these homes. And so scaling up home visiting programs is often not happening because of that expense. So we have a, a large federal grant now where we are doing a hybrid. We're keeping all the components of the program intact that we feel are so critical, but we're giving parents an, an iPad or a, a netbook, and all the sessions are on it, and so they have a session opened each week, and it has a camera, so they video themselves trying something with their child and upload that. Their coach, is, who's remote, could be in another state isn't in this study, but could be. Um, views a video, annotates it, and sets up a Skype call so that they can talk together with the family and see the tape together and critique it. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. This is the remote coach. It's late at night. Moms love this program because they can put the kids to bed, and then they get it. We see lots of moms in their pajamas doing this in bed, with pillows all propped up. And they're talking to their coach. Now, they've done their little videos with their child at another 
point in the week. So this coach is on a coach call with the mom. Could we review this video? So let's talk about this week. How did, how did it go practicing labeling and all those other wonderful concepts that we've learned so far? Fine. I mean, I got to get the hang of it because, you know, like you say, I, you, you notice a trend. I'll say this, that, 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 and I'm starting to do names. So that helps me too. So. Well, yeah. good, good. I noticed in the videos that you were trying to catch yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I am so impressed. Let's go to the video since we're already getting ahead of ourselves talking about those concepts that okay. apparently you paid very well attention. <laughs> very focused in her program. I'm going to send some stars. Let me remind myself. Send <laughs> stars. Because you are doing an awesome job. The videos are uploading on time. Props to you, ma'am. Very good job. Thank you. Now, what book, what color book is this? So you can and see the coach and, and, and the mom over here. Okay, so which one do you want to do? Which one do you want to do? Which color book do you want to color today? This, this color book. And I'll use this. I will use the mermaid coloring book. So yeah, again, um, wonderful. You're catching yourself and you're enjoying the activity by also labeling and describing those wonderful things. Let's just remember not to take it to the point where it's unnatural. Let's make it about uh, when she's interested in something or when she's doing something to go ahead and label them, not okay. necessarily force her to say it or repeat it after you. Just come natural and, and you'll see how It'll become a habit, and you got this, you got this. Okay. What's our name going to be? Jingle Bell. Jingle Bell. Okay, that sounds like a song. It sounds like a Christmas song to me. So silly. What do you think about that? I think it could be Minnie Mouse. Minnie Mouse? Okay, well, call them Minnie Mouse. Call them real quick. Oh, do that deep. And I think it's my mermaid's tail. Good job. Mama smiling. Don't forget, what is Minnie doing? She's cooking. Well, she's cooking. Yes, yeah. and what Mickey's doing? Cooking. Cooking. Yes, yeah, he's making cookies. So you can put them in the oven. So I saw some wonderful things that you did to maintain her interest in coloring that coloring book. What did you notice that you were doing? Asking her about the pictures and what she was coloring, what they do. I mean, about the cookies and how they go into the oven, pretty much making conversation. Yes, you were talking about what she was doing, asking her questions, and she was just talking to you. She was expressing herself. She was telling you, I'm doing this and that. And do you notice how not only you were maintaining her interest, but you were also doing those strategies for building the vocabulary and the language. Yes. I'm sending so many gold stars tonight. I am so proud. <laughs> now that we've talked about these things and you've gone. So it's pretty powerful when you see a caregiver get involved in this program and, and, and it is parents that get involved and sign up for the program. Uh, they're different than parents that don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, because they're... A, oh, don't worry. Sorry. Excuse me. Um, but they, we see this kind of change. Uh, this is not an exception. Um, this mother is crazy about her kids, but she just wasn't aware that uh, one thing she wasn't doing is providing rich language stimulation. And in a short amount of time, she has turned that around. And, and it's going to have an incredible impact on this child. So 
I want to turn real quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, to other environments. Children spend, many children spend a lot of time in center-based environments, childcare, family day homes, um, and then later pre-K. And those environments can also be incredibly powerful. But if you look at this, these characteristics, I think you'll notice, are very much what I've been talking about as important in the home environment. Reciprocal interactions, lots of rich language input, opportunities for children to talk, express themselves. And so it's not about the furniture. There really, there doesn't have to be beautiful furniture. If you have this happening, this is what's going to make the big difference. And it's not also always about things like, believe it or not, teachers' degrees are not predictive of this kind of interaction or of success for children. They may be important, but they, they're only important if they promote these types of interaction. At CLI, we run the State Center for Early Childhood and the, have a statewide research proven program called Texas School Ready. And we have this a really straightforward equation or recipe for what parents need to look for in classroom environments. Again, there's that responsiveness. Add it to content like letters, counting, words, science. Flexible groupings, we're finding, are critically important because some children need more individualized attention. Planning, and we really encourage teachers to monitor children's learning across the year. I want to quickly show you these children in this video. There's four or five of them. I have a video of them in a large group. They're rolling around on the floor. They're not listening. They're not raising their hand. They never have a response. They have delayed language development. And so we have developed a complementary curriculum called Developing Talkers. And all of these classrooms across the state use this with the children that need more individualized support to build their language skills. I think you'll notice how engaged these children are when they get instruction and attention that supports their learning needs. Could we see this one, please? What was wrong with the rock? I blew off the head. So how I put too heavy. What was wrong with the pail, Richard? Uh, he did it. It was too deep. Deep, 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 good. Deep. Now he got tangled. Tangled. Good, tangled up in the net because it had too many holes. holes. Very good. Very good responses. Yeah, very good. I think that if we do a program like this now to pick the ones who need that little extra help, need that one-on-one -on -one attention, and find that their weaknesses and try to improve on their weaknesses, that will help them down the line so much. We're going to okay, play let's, a game that will right around. <clears throat> when so I show you pictures teachers of like this teacher, uh, she does not have a degree but she gets extensive training through Texas School Ready. And she gets resources like this curriculum where all the rich words are outlined for her in, her, in the children's books with child-friendly definitions, follow-up questions. So she has a, a rich set of resources to help support her to help the children with their language development. So what I think is probably the most important step we need to take in our communities is to bring the home environment together with the school environment. We can't count on it all happening in childcare or the school. We can't count on it all happening in the home. So I, I want to talk for a minute about how there are so many common goals across home and school. But believe it or not, we're not doing this. We're not bringing the home environment
together with the school environment and aligning the support the children get in those two environments. So sensitive responsiveness, school and home. Intentional child-directed learning activities, rich language support. Those are all goals for both of those environments. And we're missing an opportunity for very young children when we don't have programs that put the two together. Real quickly, let's look at the mother on the left, and then you're going to see the teacher on the right. And you can hardly tell the difference in these high-quality interactions. And imagine if children got those all the time, whether they're at home or school, what we could do for children from low-income homes. Thanks. Please. Who's this? Me and, and Mommy. Yeah, and you were doing what? Sleepwalking. Sleep you were sleepwalking? Yeah. <laughs> you were sleeping, and I was walking, pushing you in the stroller. You're sleepwalking? Charles, you tell me about your flower. A rose. Very nice. Can Bumblebee pick this up? You want to tell me anything else about it? Mm -hmm. no. What else? My mama likes these roses. Your mom likes roses? Sometimes somebody picked the red belt, um, berries up. The red berries? What else about your flower? Um, it's nice and slow. It's nice and slow. I will so I hope you can see how the very same things need to happen in these very young ages. And um, we have as many challenges in classroom environments as we do in home environments to get this type of conversation and rich talk happening in our classrooms. This is the hardest thing to get teachers to do. Um, so we really need to tackle both environments. So we're doing that in a big federal study where we take Head Start classes and we randomize them to the Texas School Ready, which is a model program for business as usual. And within each of those types of classrooms, we randomize some families to get PALS. So there's a parent home program and some families not to get PALS. And we, we're in the middle of this, so I'm just gonna show you some encouraging preliminary results. Because this allows us to see if Texas School Ready plus PALS gives us the best effect on the child's learning versus either one of those alone or neither one. And so over here on the left, English vocabulary, if we put, look at the children that are getting Texas School Ready, rich quality program in their classroom, and their family is getting this program I've just showed you, we get, and this is just after one year, so this could change, I'm excited about it, but uh, I'm holding my breath to hope that it holds up. But we see a very nice significant effect on vocabulary when you put the two together. And these are four-year-olds in pre-K, so they have not gotten an early program. Then when we look down here for more complex language, same thing. It's not as significant, but the effect size is amazing. And then for children from Hispanic homes, Spanish-speaking homes, where they're hearing Spanish, but they may be hearing more English in the Head Start classroom, we get an effect of PALS alone on their vocabulary. So this is very encouraging. So the other thing that we're doing, and this is available to every community in Texas, free. We have built a very wonderful tech platform called CLI Engage. It houses professional development for birth to five teachers, staff, parent activities, progress monitoring that informs instruction, 300 and 60 curriculum activities at each of the age ranges with video examples that can be printed out and used as a curriculum. 
and coaching tools. And it was launched not more than three years ago. And this is the uptake across the state so far. Just people are sending in to register for this. They're making extensive use of it. And we're particularly excited about our new launch, which is the infant and toddler. At the same array of resources, we're building these courses. We've already la launched language. It has the curriculum activities with videos. So for child care centers that can't buy one of those big um, curriculums that cost $4,000 and it's way more than you need, you have a whole curriculum at no cost on this platform. Um, these are aligned with the state infant toddler guidelines. And so we're very excited to get the word out on this. We think it's very important for communities to work together to figure out how to support child care centers serving low-income children to make effective use of these resources because you can have all of this, but we really need hands on deck to help folks be aware of how rich this set of resources is and what they can do with it. We have a new um, thing happening in the state. Amazingly, it's the first time I can remember where the governor's uh, bill for quality pre-K dollars, HB4, that passed last session and hopefully will be refunded this session, requires a school district, if they're going to get the, the funds, to have a parent engagement, a full parent engagement. So we have put parent activities with video exemplars on Engage for school districts to make use of. So do I have a minute left, Bill? I, I just want to end with this because this is a mother who's really in very uh, difficult uh, home environment. She is very poor, has had illnesses, other family members, but she wanted to do PALS. And she's the primary caregiver for these three children, although they're not all her children. And her coach had called this day and said, um, I noticed you didn't upload a video. Could we just talk and you do an activity and I'll coach you through it? And she was embarrassed and she said, oh, I didn't plan anything. And the little boy ran and grabbed one of the books that we provided through PALS. And he said, Mom, let's read. And so they are reading together. And this was not something they typically did before PALS. And I just want you to look at the closeness, the connection, the interest of these children who have not had this experience routinely like many middle and upper middle income children. Video, please. Yeah. Yes. And that's in the kitchen.